Most CRTs like these today end up in the dumpster. And so I was thinking, what could the future be for this Toshiba set? Instead of ending up in the dump, maybe we could restore it and modify it to display RGB. Well, here are three of these Toshibas that we're going to start with. And this model right here is the AF Toshiba 14AF44. It's a perfect candidate for an RGB MUX mod. But first, I want to make sure and restore it. And actually, there's a couple here. So I'm going to go ahead and start restoring this one and this one and then I'm going to pick the best of these two and we're going to RGB MUX one of those two. It's just running here and we're doing some initial testing of the screen. Everything looks fine. I'm going to remove this shell and see what's been kept inside here for the last 20 years. Should slide right off. Whew, smells terrible. Look at it. You can see the nicotine tar here on the back of the tube as well as a flyback. See that brownish gunk? It's just disgusting. Uh, ugh, golly. So yeah, it's one of the hazards of this job. Okay, I've got a little swab with some alcohol on the tip. We're going to hit it. I'm not going to rub over here with it because that's the liner of the outside of the tube. Aquadag. We don't want to mess with that. Go over here in the shinier areas near this and let's just... See if we can get any of that residue. It's just finally starting to work itself clean. How nasty is that? Look at that. Gross. Oh. Imagine what this person's lungs look like at this point. If this is what a CRT looks like that they just got secondhand smoke. Who says secondhand smoke isn't dangerous? This is like proof, right? Yeah, I spent some time cleaning out the back of this CRT to the point where I feel comfortable touching the anode cap to discharge it, which is what I'm going to set up and do right now. All right, so there were actually three of these Toshibas in my shop, and I worked on all three of them. And uh, when I went to discharge them, funny enough, I couldn't get any of them to actually discharge when I was setting up to film. Uh, they just didn't have any spark in them. But when I did live streams and worked on the two Toshibas on the live streams, these AFs, uh, they both zapped that time. And these are Orion tubes, so I would always be careful and expect there to be a zap on these Toshibas, even though I didn't get one this time. Well, here's the main board, and it's still got a bit of residue on there, so I'm going to clean it some more. And then I'm going to go ahead and install the cap kit, which is going to be pretty much all these caps. We have a whole power block here that will get recapped. And then uh, I'm going to recap the deflection, which is this area. I'm going to replace this one too. It looks a bit dodgy right here. And a few of these other ones will get replaced. All this is going to get cleaned ahead of the uh, RGB mod. So I'm going to remove these capacitors and clean the board and I'll show you what all that looks like afterwards. All right, I've removed all the capacitors from the cap kit that I was telling you about in here. I'm just gonna show you. The board has been cleaned up too. Went through and cleaned it pretty thoroughly, simply because of all the secondhand smoke that was inside of this one. I don't think I'll be able to get every bit of it, but I wanted to get as much as possible, so I did take some extra time to clean it all out and here's our deflection cap kit and again this is all preventative maintenance because if we're going to do things like RGB mod this we don't want it to be in use and have like a deflection failure uh, so the caps are out I'm about to put the new caps in I have reflowed solder on our transformers here fly back and then there's a second power transformer up here in the power supply right and here's another transformer. Things like that get fresh solder tra transformer right there. And then everything that's not a surface mount component on this neck board got reflowed. It's a pretty simple neck board. It doesn't even have a capacitor on it. But anyway, cleaned, reflowed, solder. I'm going to clean the board again after I install the capacitor kit. Here's our finished board. And the cleaning went really well. 
you can see the shine off the fresh solder points right there on that board and I'll clean this side now I don't think I would be able to really get this a thousand percent or I guess I mean a hundred percent clean of all cigarette soot unless I did something like an ultrasonic clean and I just don't have that size of equipment here but the new caps are all in here I've double checked everything it look good everything installed right so I'm gonna put this back in the tube area and uh, we're gonna run a test all right let's run a test just to make sure that the CRT is still working after that restoration we don't have any problems I've got power obviously going into it here coming on and we just have a Super Nintendo over there with the HD Retrovision component cables going in and on the Toshibas they tried to get goofy and call their component color stream video which you saw the color stream input come up on the screen that's just their way of saying that it's the higher resolution component video mode and obviously this one works so that's all good I'm gonna let it run for a little bit and make sure that there's no issues um, at least after it warms up 20 or 30 minutes and then we will tear it all back down and start RGB modding it. <laughs> so last month I was able to show you how this lovely MUX kit can add RGB to a 36 inch Sony Trinitron and turn it into an absolute gaming beast. What I want to do now is I want to test this little guy, this little Sunthar RGB MUX kit. All right, I'm back at Sector Sunthar's website. We're gonna look here the guide real quick for a 14 AF44. We need to remove these three resistors, those three coupling capacitors. And they are mapped out right there. And there's a picture of them that those six items need to be removed. Just surface mount components. I'll show you on the board where those are. This shows you here just what the traces are run out to, red, green, and blue, and then blanking. And then you can install your conductors there. Looks like once you remove all those parts, you go in and you can install the red, green, and blue and blanking there. And uh, then the rest of the stuff. This will all be detailed below. Let me show you how this looks here on our board. This is our chassis that you've seen me work on now. And if we look over here, this is that area I went in and removed all those six components right there and then there's the green there's the red there's blanking i actually added this orange ground it's an additional ground um, on the pinout and there's blue now that's all good i checked all that made sure nothing was shorting to ground or to each other and it's not i did add a little bit of Sticky glue, sticky glue, sticky glue, and I've routed off my sound. This is how I wired it up. So this is a ground, it's purple, and that's a ground point right there. If we go next to that, this is a composite video line right here. So that's what we're going to tie into for our composite video sync on yellow. And then this is our black, is our ground again, it's another ground. So we got two grounds over here. Then we have left and right audio. And so the gray right here is left audio. That going right there. And this white cable is right audio. And so all that goes on this connection cable that comes with your kit. And actually, check it out. I just did a little ground bridge here with a a leftover leg of a resistor and I put some heat shrink tubing on that so I could hold my cable in place right here rather than having to put glue on the edge there and that way that can flip up and come back to the input board where ultimately it will connect in to our SCART input so the next thing we need to do is build that SCART input and then we can test this whole thing out. So this is the MUX kit board that I am using it's what does it say version 1, 2C, the SCART input soldered in, and then this is the specific build out of resistors 
diode and this is actually just a bridge on R11 there so that's all custom made based on the information on the MUX mod itself and that's available with the guide I showed you so all I need to do is plug this in to our circuit board put it all back together in the TV and let's see if we have RGB all right I've connected the modification kit board right there into the conductors and I've got power plugged into the set let's let's send in some RGB here from the Super Famicom we'll make sure of course that we have power let's see there we go so that's good all right let's see what happens Well, look at there. What does that say? Color stream? Okay, great. Look at that. Solid picture. Blue, red, green. Excellent. So the kit is syncing and working here with the Super Nintendo. I'd like to see if the audio is working. Oh yes, there it is. Okay, great. This is one of the trickier things, is trying to figure out where you're going to mount the SCART. I decided to do it right here because this is a blank area um, over here this point and over that's the flyback and there's really nothing in here but uh, blank board area and then over here is the input uh, jacks on the board so this is a good spot I did have to cut this with a Dremel and then I use a file to get it cleaned up a little bit more and then I will also use drill bits and I don't actually use the drill bits with the drill I just spin it with my hands like this to cut the holes in this old plastic and I've got two screws mounted so it's just a matter of mounting that SCART input and then reassembling this whole TV I set up a little demonstration here with the CRT now what you see right now is just the DVD menu and it is um, component video so it's on this color stream input let me show you it is plugged in back here right there in the normal spot and then I've got the SCART cable plugged in also so the TV right now is in normal mode I don't want to like send two signals down that color stream at the same time because I don't think it'll mess it up but I just don't really want to do that so if I power off my DVD player and I have no signal going in there and then I just power on the SNES there you go RGB mode is uh, right there so it's just uh, like a shared input and all the other inputs work for composite and S-video. Alright, check this out. So there is one thing I found here. So if this TV has, you know, you can hear the sound working. It's in RGB mode right now. But if I am using component over here and then I plug in. Watch, it'll, it'll mute it if I plug in the audio cables from the component color stream input. If I put that in, it actually disables the audio from the SCART input. So, that's interesting. If you really want to use the audio um, on this set and component and SCART RGB, then I would recommend, since there's no audio out on this television, I would recommend feeding your component audio source through a receiver or something else. I'm going to try to show you how much difference there is in a picture using this test screen from the 240p test suite. Now specifically let's look at the characters along the top here in the English alphabet A, B, C, D, E, and F. And um, again we're using RGB through the RGB MUX kit. And I just want you to see how sharp this lettering looks. I'm going to switch it over to component video using 
the HD Retrovision cables and we're going to see what this screen looks like when I do that. Okay, I've switched over to component video and again we're going to look in here at the characters and what I want you to notice is as we get over here to the letters there's some severe red banding coming out of those letters and so that's definitely impacting the sharpness and the clarity of the image it's pretty consistent no matter where it is on the screen and so that tells me there's some kind of color processing being done over the Kapoda video mode by the TV itself and using RGB and muxing it actually is improving our image quality and getting rid of that banding issue um, so it's a way better result than I actually thought it would be so these mux kits and RGB modifications do really breathe new life into these old televisions and I hope that last demonstration kind of pointed out how these kits will actually bypass a lot of these televisions picture processing that they put on their component video modes and this could be everything from a red push um, on the red line of color to all kinds of weird comb filters that may actually introduce artifacts and in the case of this CRT, we had a weird bleeding effect. And so the idea that you could bypass that and send in the raw RGB signal and actually get a sharper image is actually um, quite a bigger bonus on these TVs that already have component. I was able to test the NES Zapper with this television and I didn't have a single issue over RGB. Again, my NES is RGB modded and I was using a SCART cable into the back of the TV and as you can see here, I was playing both Wild Gunman and Duck Hunt, both modes, both the duck mode and the clay shooting mode. And I actually didn't have a single issue uh, with the light gun picking up and actually hitting the targets on the screen. Now the funny thing is is we've gone through a lot of Toshiba sets here in the shop lately and we've only found Orion tubes, right? So um, actually now that we've finished up with this Toshiba flat screen MUX mod, let's see about finding an actual Toshiba tube inside of a CRT. Now that we've worked through that, let's take a look at a different tube and this one is actually believe it or not made by Toshiba 370NVB22 and this is a 13 inch tube and it's from a 1980s CRT monitor there's the chassis and the back of that CRT the chassis has been fully rebuilt but now we're just doing some cleaning because the prior owner of this CRT actually was a cigarette smoker and it was a bunch of cigarettes soot. so there's the inside of the monitor shell these old CRTs that are PC monitors generally were made of a lot of plastic well, now we're gonna stick the restored chassis here back in should slide under those cables. Get the degaussing cable out of the way. There we go. Just watch the power button. Now I'll connect everything up. Here's the front. It's all put back together there and I do need to put some screws in the front there, uh, but the power button's right and ready to go. I've got a signal put in. Maybe some static. Oh, there we go. Uh oh. Okay, something's not right because the vertical deflection is half missing. Oh boy, I did something wrong. Hang on. 
All right, let's try this again. See if I got it right this time. Okay, there's, oh great. It's all the way down there. Whew, thank goodness. All right, let me show you what I did wrong. Uh, so here's my capacitor kit list. And the two that I highlighted were incorrect. Uh, what I had done was I had written the wrong value. I thought this was a 47 UF. It was actually a 4.7. And down here I thought this was a 2.2 UF and it was in actuality a 22. And I found that out by inspecting all the old capacitors. And then I found those two that were incorrect. I switched, I switched them out uh, based on double checking my guide. And the reason I screwed up this guide was because I was trying to do this on a live stream. And... Uh, I guess I missed a couple things or I couldn't see right. Goodness gracious. All right, I'm gonna show you some footage here of what I've got is the PC Core Graphics Console. This is the spark plug from Insurrection Industries. This is a cable that goes out to uh, composite video from Retrofrog. So those are good products. And then we've got it fed into the monitor here. You get a very sharp image through composite and I really love the way that this restoration right here turned out. It just looks great. All right, before I get out of here, I'm actually gonna give you a third CRT repair. This is a pretty awesome bonus episode. I really hope you enjoyed hanging out with me today. And uh, what I've got for you now is what happens when you run into one of these old CRT monitors and the power button's broken. Let's say it's just either cracked or it's not even there anymore. Maybe it's fallen off. But that's what we're going to try to check out now is how to fix that power button. Even if you don't have a replacement power switch for your CRT or monitor, we've got a workaround for that. Let's do that now and then maybe even do a little bit of restoration on this CRT. It's a pretty awesome Commodore monitor that I've never shown on the channel before. So I'm happy to debut it here now to you. All right, we have a Commodore 1084S CRT in the shop. Check it out. This has push down front with some controls on it. Volume and screen controls right there. The power button is around back on this CRT. Let's look at this label here. This is made in Korea, August of 1992. It is 60 hertz, 120 volt AC, one amp, 1084S-D2. And then here's some things for the inputs. Looks like you can use S-Video, composite, and then it does do RGB, which is this nice SCART adapter right here does have audio in and then some more screen controls here power input and then the power button uh, the problem with this one is the power button has somewhat failed it, it won't stay stuck in so watch the screen here I'm gonna hold the power button down you'll notice it powering on it's in RGB mode now so it's actually getting RGB fed through from the Super Nintendo. So something's going on with the button. Because if I let it go, it just turns itself off. All right, we've opened it up and surprising, it's an Orion tube in here. And then here's the circuit board, here's our button, and as you can see, you push it in to power it on, it should stay in, it just doesn't stay in now. I probably won't be able to find a replacement for that button, but I can manually just solder a bridge on here so it's always closed, and anytime you actually send power through the power input here, we can have... Anytime you turn power on, just have it automatically turn on. Probably going to be the solution there. Next thing we're going to do is remove this and recap a lot of it. 
just as a preventative uh, measure. It's really clean in here. Otherwise, I wonder if it'll have a zap on this anode cap. Let's see. I'm going to say probably not. Let's put that down. And find, oh there it is. My discharge tool. I'm going to take one end of the discharge tool and attach it over here. That ground strap. Let's see. Let's see if we get any kind of electrical zap here. No. Let's see what about the cap? Nothing. So this one seems to have discharged itself. Okay, so this is the bottom of the switch on the circuit board and it's broken. So what this switch essentially does though is when you push it down it's supposed to click closed and then it will bridge this point to this point and then this point right here to this point. So it just closes that gap on both those sides and then it allows electricity to flow through it. So essentially if we just install a bridge uh, jumper across these two points it'll pretty much always be turned on no matter what this button does so the button can at least stay there but it won't actually function and uh, that's probably going to be our best solution since the button itself has mechanically failed internally that's our problem okay so I'm gonna show you how this works with a little demonstration my meters plugged up here and I've got one leg touching each one of those legs of that button and hopefully I can press this down with one hand and you see now it's got continuity but since the button won't click it won't stay but normally it would stay and you'd have power so if we just bridge that we'll always have power and uh, that's really all we need to do here's this rebuilt board now all new capacitors in here and even on the neck board as well as a solder reflow hopefully give it a chance to last a long time boards are real clean but then if we look under here this is our repair area simple jumper here so now all we need to do is set this back up with the tube and run a test and hopefully everything will work as intended there's all those bad capacitors and I'm set up now to test everything out let's hope I did everything correctly I have the RGB adapter plugged in right there power in that console is turned on but that surge protector is not turned on let's see what happens goodness when I press it because it should turn the monitor on this is the first time I've tried it so let's see if I can get everything in the view here I don't know let's just do it and see what happens okay powers on yes I think we're okay obviously the image has shifted a little bit but it looks to be stable and our power is on nothing back here is smoking that's always a good sign oh yeah there you have it RGB 
I'm going to have to make some adjustments to the set and then we'll take another look at it after I get all that done. But I'm very happy that all the hard work is finished. Alright, so this monitor is working pretty perfect right now. I did dial it in. As far as some color adjustments, I, I made some and then I definitely adjusted the geometry. Now thankfully, most of the geometry controls that you need are on the outside on the back of the CRT monitor, but just check it out. See, you can get a good defined scan line on this, similar to like a PVM on this Commodore monitor. It definitely get that scan line effect of the 240p image shown on the tube um, through RGB. So I definitely like this CRT. I mean, it's awesome, right? Check it out. I mean, it's great for something like this as well as retro PCs, but I even like it for a video game machine. Okay, so to power it off, we need to come down here and just cut the power. Just like that. That's all there is. All right, wow, so that's it. That's all I've got today in this week's episode. Um, sorry, I know it's been a couple weeks since I've posted anything. Now that school season's about to be back in session here in the United States, I will be able to have more regular live streams in the bunker, the new bunker, and uh, so once that school year gets started in September, we'll be having a lot more open time to, uh, you know, do those live streams and live shows with all of you. And we can get into some live CRT restoration, repair work, studies, whatever we're working on. I also want to give one more mention to the Retro World Expo, August 23rd to 25th in Hartford, Connecticut. If you want to go there and see my live presentation, I will be there. I will be giving tips and secrets and talks about the CRT and everything you can do to uh, navigate around one, maintain one, and keep yourself safe while doing all that. So again, thank you for hanging out in this extremely long video. I will see you all next time for some more retro content. Yo! Hey man, what's going on? Oh, uh, well. Now, I, I really wasn't expecting to see you again. Yeah, that's right. How you been doing? I see you're still messing with those CRTs. Yeah, you know, I was thinking maybe you stayed at the old bunker, little Stevie Retro. So tell me, when'd you get this cool, well, when did we get this cool mustache? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Well, how long do we get to keep it? I don't know, you know, as long as the wife says it's okay. I guess you better take care of the old lady then, huh? All right, hey, hey, enough of that. No, man, this is bull crap. You've been gone way too long. You tried to leave me in that stupid, stuffy basement, and you owe everybody here at least one more restoration in this video. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm not kidding. I don't care if it takes 20 more minutes. You owe all of us one more CRT restoration. All right, just not for you, but for all of you, I will show you one more restoration. And uh, I can't promise that I'll have a mustache in this one. All right, man, I knew you were cool. Hey, everybody, welcome back today into the CRT shop. I've got uh, my friend Cole here, and we're actually going to be working on something in here that's unique. It's a brand new CRT that I've never seen and you can kind of see it right here we're gonna go inside I'm gonna show you a closer look at this thing uh, because it's a pretty neat PC CRT all right here it is this is an amazing uh, let me show you the brand here actually it's a Hyundai and I was able to find the service manual for this one so I'll send you some more or I'll have links to that in the description below but this is a flat screen tube you can tell right there and 20 inches. It's pretty compact in design compared to a lot of other ones. 
that are 20 inches in PC CRTs. Let's look at the tube in here. Now it's a Samsung M49, oh sorry, M46 QCK 761X123. And then there's our board down there, which I'm actually going to be pulling this board and recapping it and checking it out. We'll also do the same with the neck board. Uh, this is this pretty nice deflection yoke right here. Are some potentiometers up top that can adjust actually convergence uh, right there. That's what those four should do in case you have a convergence issue that you want to tighten up. Now this is normally covered with a big piece of shielding which I have removed and set over here and that goes over top. You even have a nice guard there for the anode cap and then the real issue with these is always getting these tops off the shells so I didn't want to bore you showing you how I got that off uh, because it took me a long time of just trying to manipulate and get in and getting these latches to release right here push in there pushes that latch out and I was finally able to slide that top off and you also have to pop off these things off the front these little pieces of plastic and that's what's holding it all together so it's a pretty high quality looking CRT. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to set up and uh, probably discharge this thing. We can catch a zap here. This may also have a bleeder resistor. All right, there it is. Let's see what happens when I get close. Yeah, nothing. So we definitely have a resistor in here. There we go. See? No zap on this one all right the crt has been discharged and everything is disconnected aside from this one cable down here that i can't reach what it looks like to me is that this is just sitting in this shell there's no uh, bolts holding this crt into the actual frame it's just held in by the plastic you can actually tell where this bracket looks like it had the uh Maybe the corner mount's actually removed. It's a little rough there, like it was scraped off. Anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift this out. That way I can get that board down there and the neck board out, and we can service them. So the CRT will just come out, and I'll set it to the side. All right, that was simple enough. I suggest if you have to do something like this that you set the CRT face down on a very cushy, plushy thing that won't risk scratching anything or... Uh, rubbing anything and uh, damaging the tube but it can sit there and then we can come over here and get our boards out now and if i'm looking down in here i don't know i see some mounting screw right there and i see one back there and a couple of other things that i need to remove so i'm going to remove those and then i'll pull this whole board and assembly out to service. Okay, I was able to get the boards out of there. There's a couple of screws holding them in, and then these uh, were in each side. Let's see, I think they were slipped down in there like that, just like that, so the tube can set against it. They just slip in. So you remove those, and then you can get the board out. I will warn you, there's a screw down here for the ground point on the power input that's gonna hold you up on your board when you try to pull it out you have to kind of work it over that bend the board a little bit not too much to where it snaps or anything but you do have to do that to get around that screw right there and so if we go into the lab over here we have the board and this is everything right here and if I look at it I can tell this is our power section. This is where our main power comes in. Power board area, so we'll replace all this stuff. I'm actually gonna probably recap this board 100% because these capacitors, they, some of them look a bit dodgy just for age purposes. So we'll do all that. The deflection capacitors are gonna be over in here near the flyback on that side. So we have to make a custom cap kit for this one. 
and we'll reflow some solder on these important areas down here but overall the board looks pretty good and then up here we have a bunch of shielding we'll need to remove so that we can eventually service that board because there's Goodness, there might be just as many capacitors on the neck board as there are on the main board. Just kidding, but it really does look like there's about, I don't know, 20 of them in there or something. So good amount of caps hiding. All right, here's our board built out, completely decapped. So all the capacitors that are electrolytic have been removed. I will warn you. Make sure you pay attention because some of the capacitors are um, they are bipolar on these sets, and sometimes the service manual will not tell you. Let me, here, for example, CH32. You notice no polarity on that. It's because that's a capacitor that is bipolar. Other things I found. She found some weird modification that had been done over here where it looks like two diodes were disconnected. <clears throat> oh, truckers. <clears throat> All right. So I found a little modification down here where these two diodes had been removed from circuit and then actually tied in over here at this junction. So that was something that I had found. I don't have any documentation on that, and so I'm not changing any of that. Um, this too, this was found. This is some type of bodge in repair work or something that was done, and uh, still is a little dirty. So I'm going to clean that up a little bit, as well as reflow some solder on here and install the new capacitors. And that's about it. All right, here we have it. The board is serviced and recapped. Got a solder reflow done on it. I was just gonna point out some specific areas right here. First, let's look closer at this. This was the area that had been worked on prior. The dogs over there, the neighbors are going wild, huh? Anyway, there you go. So some, some of that was cleaned up. I redid the solder on it took all the old out and uh, that's what it looks like now I'm not really concerned about it uh, now right it looks much better than it did at least it's clean there's some fresh solder you can see on especially over here next to the flyback assembly and then let's see here's the entire recapped board now I will tell you I have been going through after I recap a board and making a um, doing a recheck basically to make sure I have installed every correct capacitor and you wouldn't be I mean you'd be surprised there's at least feel like one board that I work on a month where I'll install one capacitor that's wrong and so I have to do those checks or I'll screw something up myself so what I do is I go through after I recap the board and clean it I refer back to my cap kit list and uh, then I come through here and I make a mark after I've verified the location of the capacitor and that it has the correct value that it is sitting incorrectly as far as polarity and uh, that's it. So let's get this board back into the frame and then we'll set the CRT on top of it and fire it up for a test run. All right, I have it all set back up and I just turned it on. And oh goodness, I was really nervous because always working on something new, you never know for sure what happens, especially on the first power up. So uh, thankfully everything was working perfectly normal so far. And I'm letting it warm up here. And then uh, I'm gonna do some adjustments to it because if we look down here, it looks very blurry kinda. I'm gonna sharpen that up. Uh, so I'm gonna adjust the focus, I'm gonna check out the brightness and and things like that and we're gonna get a little bit more dialed in and that's again after I let it warm up for about 30 minutes or so I'm gonna start making adjustments all right everybody I've let the CRT warm up and I've started to play with some of the adjustments here and one of the most amazing adjustments is the Moray reducer 
uh, on this CRT. So I recapped it and I was using it. It's probably impossible to see. I've got the flash or the, um, let's see if I remove that light. Oh, there we go. Wonderful. You see the more pattern here, how it's like in the tube right there. This is going to show up great. So if we get into this menu, there's a more adjustment. So we're going to hit here, select it. It's on minimum. Now just watch that more pattern right there. I'm going to increase it. Look at that. It has completely erased it. Okay, so just to give you a rundown on some of the adjustments you can make inside the shell, because I'm about to put the shielding back in place. I think I showed you this before, but there are convergence controls up here. I didn't need to use them to adjust anything. Convergence is nice and tight on this machine. Of course, you got the rings of doom there all over the neck of the CRT to adjust your convergence further and then the purity of the set. Down on the circuit board, there really isn't anything. So there's a variable resistor down there and that kind of adjusts the overall screen voltage. Uh, it's not actually mentioned in the service manual anywhere that I could find. So I recommend really not messing with that one right there. Uh, you do have two focus controls on your flyback. Get some light down there. So you have, there's the resistor pot. So you don't really want to mess with that one unless for some reason you think you need to. This flyback has a potentiometer to adjust focus. So dual focus adjustment and at the bottom is your G2 voltage adjustment. Well, this is ready to be pretty much finished up. And what I'm going to do is just put the outer shell back into place on this and snap it back in. And then I'm going to put those two fasteners right here on each side to secure it all in place. I just wanted to give you one final view of this thing with all that shielding back in place. The two screws are down there. It's very clean now. Everything that I showed you about the adjustments inside have already been completed. So that's no longer needed to be done and it's ready to be closed up. And this is just the final look at it before then. And let's get the lid on it. All right, all right, all right, check it out. What a great setup I have here. Let me let me tell you what I've done to actually get the 240p test suite on the screen here. And it's it's a really fun process, okay? So we've got a just VGA cable that's coming from the Dreamcast directly, right, to VGA into one of my Xtron, this is the RGB 203 RXI with ADSP and it's just three inputs and it's got an output. What I'm just feeding the signal in here. I'm not using any of the boosting stuff. You can use this to boost the signals or change the output and send it through BNC. But what I've done is I've got input one there and then I'm just outputting, there's a monitor thing. So that way I can use this proprietary cable and just go VGA to VGA. And it also tells me my signal down here, which is 31.33 kilohertz at 59.9. All right, so that's what we've got set up. That's how we went from VGA through that little box. And then I could actually use this box and make some fun adjustments and also uh, use some of the screen filters in it to manipulate the image a little bit. All right, I've completed my adjustments and run plenty of tests and I have the screen really dialed in. And the one thing I will note on this particular tube from Samsung, and it's a flat tube, of course, you've seen all that, but it does not have superior black levels on some of these modes and resolutions. Uh, the blacks are just not completely blacked out dark in an all dark room. You still see a little bit of gray flash through. I even adjusted the G2 on there before I shut it up and the brightness actually on it right now is set to zero. Alright guys, so there you have it. I'll look at one of the many different PC CRTs that are still available out there 
a lovely Hyundai Image Quest and Dreamcast ideal setup. All right, so we had a chat with the owner of the CRT, and it turns out there's some um, software in the CRT that you can use to adjust the brightness down more. So thankfully, he was able to do that, get that brightness tuned down, and then the monitor was in tip top condition and looked even better than what you saw on the screen there. So that was all great, right, Cole? Got to have Cole in such a long video, right? All right, so let's answer the question. What's the future of the CRT? I think that this whole video kind of plays out what the future is. Um, the future of the CRT is literally going to be us restoring, repairing, researching, and even modifying uh, the CRT. That's really it at this point. You know, there's no more in production. I don't care what you say. Right now, there's no more tubes being made. And uh, so with that, let's be thankful for what we can find still and try to save them, try to research them, try to repair them if need them, restore them, repair them if need them, repair them if they are needed to be repaired. Anyway, that's what I'm going to do. That answers the question for the thumbnail and... Uh, Hopefully we can find more modifications for these sets, you know, something like that Mux mod's great for RGB, but there are other modifications I've heard of. If you happen to know of anybody, any modifications that are really cool, uh, let me know. Send me a message. Put a comment below. Anyway, thanks for hanging out for this super long repair restoration marathon of your lovely CRT display. Let's keep them going. Come on. What are you still doing here? The episode is over. Why don't you watch something else? I don't know. Watch this. All right. Come on. It's over. It's all done. I mean it. It's over.